Good morning, everyone. My name is Leonel Fernandez, former president of the Dominican Republic. I have the honor and pleasure of being able to speak today to the president of the United Mexican States, Mr. Enrique Peña Nieto. I had the honor of sharing with you recently in Chile, and I remembered, uh, we remembered our first meeting. Now we have you here today. I would say uh, this is a memorable moment to talk about the achievements during your f the first year of your presidency with your reform package. It's very interesting because four years ago in 2010, Mexico was celebrating its independence bicentennial. And it marked the creation of the nation state of Mexico. And it also coincided with the 100 year celebration of the Mexican Revolution with the Querétaro Constitution. It introduced the social component for, govern for governance. Uh, later, uh, they mentioned that your party, the Institutional Revolutionary Party, the PRI, had ruled 71 years, that it was needed uh, some sort of democratic alternance in the country. That happened 12 years past, and now the PRI is back in power with you with a very important reform agenda for the transformation of the country. You have accomplished the Pact for Mexico, a pact that has five key points divided in 95 commitments. And I would like, President, for you to talk to us about how the Pact of Mexico will bring about the social, economic, cultural transformation of your country. Thank you very much, Mr. Leonel Fernandez. I am very pleased to be here in the Forum for Latin America. It's a great honor that I am here to share this panel with you so that I may share what is happening in Mexico. Here I have an opportunity to greet many people from Latin America, from Mexico, and the remaining uh, region, sister and brother countries all, whom I have had the opportunity to agree in uh, different venues. I apologize for the slight delay. It's been a very hectic morning. And uh, because of I uh, was with President Martinelli, and we signed the free trade agreement uh, with Panama and uh, other tools for greater integration between the two countries, especially in economic matters. I ask for your understanding, and uh, I, you, I will try to be uh, very uh, open in my participation. Mexico is a country that has been consolidating its democracy in the past decades. Few countries in the Latin American region and the rest of the world can, it can be said of them that uh, for 100 years, from 1934, that uh, they've had great economic, political, and social stability. In Mexico, in this democratic climate, that is increasingly consolidated, a country that's more diverse, more pluralistic, where all voices are recognized, have representation within the different venues in the political sphere that our country has. This has allowed this um, political democratic mobility, like you mentioned, in 2010, after 70 years of rule by one country in Mexico, my political party, we had political alternance. We had two administrations beginning in the year 2000. And in 2012, the party I represent, again, won the election. But regardless, uh, the uh, political reality in the country is very different. Uh, we had a hegemo hegemony in the government. Now we have uh, plural participation, diverse participation of political forces. Within this context, it was fundamental to establish conditions that would allow the country to change to effect structural changes that would make it possible for Mexico to attain greater development growth in the next years. This is what gave rise to the Pact for Mexico that you mentioned. The Pact for Mexico 
is nothing more than an agreement of political wills between the government of the republic and the main political forces in the country. We agreed jointly an agenda of structural changes that the country had postponed for years and that was fundamental to undertake within this framework of the Pact for Mexico. It was eventual that there would arise natural differences. However, the pact has provided Mexico with important structural changes, which I would like to uh, refer to and just list them and we can expand on them. First, labor reform in the transition period from the end of the previous government period and uh, the beginning of the one that I lead. It's a reform that makes the labor market more flexible, opens up hiring opportunities, especially for women, young people, who with little experience may have greater facility in joining the workforce. Beginning with this, we uh, enacted reforms on a consensual basis, a reform to improve the quality of education, recognizing that public policy in educational matters that had been undertaken until then had attained a, a fundamental element, which is educational coverage at the basic level, a preschool, a middle school, high school, and also uh, upper high school and uh, higher education. Now, the challenge is to ensure ed quality in education, and that's the goal of the education reform in Mexico, not only of a constitutional order, but through secondary legislation. The topic has been how to achieve economic growth, uh, competitiveness, production. Now, regarding that sphere, because we know Mexico has macroeconomic stability, there is a low inflation rate, uh, interest rates are low, but you have faced economic growth challenges. How is the Pact of Mexico, your government, how do you intend to launch competitiveness and economic growth? I think there have been several ways um, that um, included in the ones that I listed, whose fundamental goal is for Mexico to achieve greater economic growth. Because, uh, Mr. President, the truth is that Mexico, even though it had had positive economic growth rates on average in the last few years, they were below its potential. A, an average of 2.4% per year, low, e even more so in contrast with other regional economies that have experienced far superior growth. Facing this potential, there's reforms that will certainly influence economic growth for Mexico. F uh, we'll list some first. A reform in telecommunications to open up the sector to greater competition to achieve digital inclusion, which is indeed a challenge today to ensure that all the population can enjoy these services in uh, any part of our country. And an uh, economic competency reform, which uh, tr intends to fight monopolies and establish conditions optimal conditions within a legal framework to promote greater economic competition, a reform, a financial reform, that will uh, basically target the achievement of more credit to promote small and medium-sized businesses. This points to um, Mexico's macroeconomic conditions, which are very favorable. If the Mexican financial system is solid, robust, solvent, maybe with some uh, adjustments uh, that were made during the financial crisis that our country suffered in 1995, before that, before uh, the economic crisis, that uh, due to uh, institutional, financial institutional reasons the world experienced later. But this economic reform, I insist, is targeted to ensure greater access to credit for Mexicans and for small and medium-sized businesses. Fiscal reform, 
that is directed at bolstering the economic capacity of the state, its governments, and also to lessen dependency on oil revenues and energy reform, which is perhaps the most important, achieved within a sphere in which no legal modifications had been introduced in at least 50 years, and uh, which will become in the uh, most important uh, element to promote Mexico's economic growth, job creation, and regional development throughout the national territory. This energy reform will make it possible to have greater competition, the exploitation of new energy sources, especially clean energies, and it ensures that this is the goal of the reform for Mexico to have for its population, for its small, medium-sized companies, which are the ones that generate more jobs in Mexico, to have access to energy supplies that are cheaper, that better prices, and this will generate greater competitiveness for our country. I believe that this is the most important transcendental reform that Mexico has attained within this reform agenda that we have spoken about. And right now, the Congress is debating several of these issues. Now, uh, the reforms have taken place within the constitutional framework, but now Congress is taking care of enacting secondary legislation to ensure the achievement and implementation of these reforms that I spoke about. As you indicated, the Mexican state shall continue uh, to own hydrocarbons. And therefore, the reform is not a priv privatization. How can the private sector participate in the reforms the ones especially in the energy and telecommunications sector. In telecommunications, the reform, uh, first of all, establishes that there will be a regulatory body, CISTEL, uh, that will open up more competition within the sector. There will be more television stations. Now we have practically two. There will be more, uh, an additional one owned by the Mexican state, and this will open up competition. And can you have foreign direct investment there? Uh, there will be foreign direct investment in terms of percentages corresponding to reciprocity with other countries where the, cap the originating capital comes from. In regarding energy issues, uh, first, it is very clear in the reform that we enacted last year that the ownership of the hydrocarbons is and shall be the Mexican states. However, for its exploitation, we open up the possibility of allowing the private sector to participate in the exploitation of these. Pemex establishes conditions to allow for greater capacity and uh, bolstering it to, for allowing it to compete. And this will open up participation regarding hydrocarbons and energy sources. To this effect, a regulatory body will be created. And it will establish, first of all, a zero round in which Pemex establishes the areas that shall be developed, and certainly next year, the beginning of the year, they will establish, they will open up another round to establish uh, the possibility of participation by the private sector. This mechanism that I must insist, in which the, prop the ownership by the Mexican state prevails over hydrocarbons, but it generates mechanisms for the private sector to participate is um, based on uh, in the successful experiences of other countries, especially in the Latin American region. I can mention Brazil, the Brazilian case, the Colombian case, which uh, undertook structural changes in this sphere uh, precisely to uh, achieve greater yields in the energy sector. And why is this so relevant, reform in this matter? 
because today we observe that the world, the global map, when it comes to energy production has changed. Today, we observe that the North American region, particularly the United States, has achieved a greater self-sufficiency when it comes to energy matters, that they now have new sources for exploitation, especially shale gas, and uh, this uh, swath that uh, borders with our country. So uh, this North American region, particularly the United States, it's made it a more competitive region. So this forces Mexico to undertake structural changes to be in conditions of greater competition, competitiveness. Otherwise, we'll be losing investment that could arrive in our country and uh, that that having a more expensive energy supplies would not achieve. I must insist the purpose of this reform is for energy supplies to be cheaper, for Mexico to be more competitive, to make it more possible to generate more jobs, greater economic growth for our country. Mr. President, uh, in uh, regarding energy reform, we're talking about oil, natural gas, and the electrical sector reform, and as you added, uh, the fact that in Mexico, uh, you know, there's a shale gas that uh, perhaps requires new regulation because it's a, a new element. How can there be participation in the reform of the electrical se sector? And uh, what regulation have you thought about regarding shale gas? Uh, well, that's exactly what Congress is debating. And as soon as the initiative is presented uh, for the secondary legislation, uh, to maintain the spirit of the constitutional reform that has taken place in the energy sector, how can we translate this to a secondary legislation that shall ensure that the Mexican state will keep ownership over hydrocarbons? And second, as is also established in the Constitution, what will be the mechanisms to speed up the exploitation of other energy generating sources like shale gas, and uh, in matters of uh, electrical energy, the same as uh, as in oil, there has been created a regulatory body to uh, promote the participation of the private sector to take advantage of the networks of distribution that the uh, federal authorities have so that energy can be distributed through more regions in more regions of the country, and more importantly, to ensure that electric energy is cheaper. At the end of the day, the Federal Elect Electricity Commission shall be the uh, main generating uh, energy body, but the private sector might also become a co-generator of energy. So uh, I will tell you that in Mexico, we do have cogeneration of electricity, but this benefit reaches uh, basically only those who have the financial capacity to generate electric energy. But uh, small and medium-sized businesses and uh, the major users don't see benefits of uh, being able to generate uh, more energy uh, with mechanisms with economic me mechanisms at a lower cost and achieve, as a result, uh, paying less for electric energy. Uh, so uh, Mexico has to become more competitive. And the reform made regarding energy is uh, aiming for this goal so that energy is a more, it's cheaper in Mexico so that our hydrocarb hydrocarbon exploitation may uh, become more competitive that our country can develop an industry with greater technology, innovative capacity to compete in Mexico and generate energy, and at the same time, generate more energy with the participation of the private sector and that this benefits all Mexicans, especially small and medium-sized businesses, which are the ones that generate employment in our country.
well, we clearly see in this a reform project, uh, the fiscal reform, where Mexico only receives 12% uh, of uh, tax. It's probably one of the uh, lower, lower countries uh, in Latin America because of oil revenue. Uh, the reforms in the energy sector, telecommunications, but uh, looking at Mexico's development ma model, when you analyze the situation of Latin America in the last 10 years, and you speak about this uh, bonanza we've had, we, uh, we've uh, had a lot of exports of res raw resources uh, to China, but there's also in Mexico manufacturing, uh, there's a uh, high technology, software, aerospatial, uh, automotive industry, tied into the economy of the United States. How do you see the sustainability of the Mexican economic model that is based uh, on a capital intensive uh, model? Well, I, th I think that uh, the path, that uh, the right path that Mexico followed and must continue to follow. Uh, first, to be a great promoter of free, free trade. We are perhaps the most open uh, country in Latin America, Latin America toward the world with our agreements that we have with different regions and countries. And consequently, this has generated these structural changes to increase the country's competitiveness and to allow for a greater capacity for our own production, Mexican-made, that allows us to co that would allow us to compete in other markets. And uh, what can I say about Mexico? We are a country that, without doubt, has been incorporating, or has achieved greater development in areas uh, such as specialized manufacturing. We are the fourth exporter in the world of vehicles to other regions. We are the eighth producer and the fourth exporter. We have been advancing in the aerospatial industry. We have become the sixth provider for the United States in this field. And without a doubt, our trade toward North America has intensified. And uh, I can say the same regarding other specialized industries where we, we hold a, a prominent place. We are the first producer and exporter of TVs, plasmas, uh, electric appliances. So I want to say that Mexico effectively has been building and creating a platform for its economic growth based on, first, becoming a center, a logistical center, due to our geographic location that will allow us to participate in different markets and to make Mexico a market, a platform for participation for other countries so they can access those other markets. Mexico has free trade agreements that provide the opportunity to um, access a, a one billion person a people market. And on the other hand, we have incorporated specialized industries as in the examples that you know I have used to illustrate uh, what I have been talking about, Mexico, uh, for example, it, our colleges uh, graduate, which does not happen, which does not happens uh, in other countries, uh, about 100,000 engineers per year. So uh, this gives you an idea of where we're focusing our uh, development for our country's economic growth. And uh, according to the line that you've uh, drawn for us, uh, Mexico has been following this uh, for a few years. It's the same path we continue to take, to promote. Today, we work to ensure, as a result of the educational reform, that we will have the skills, the capabilities of our students so they will be able to incorporate themselves into this labor market that is being built in Mexico, this specialized uh, 
market and uh, also uh, to ensure uh, that they break away with a tradition of uh, just uh, working, uh, just of maquilas, which are jobs that are perhaps uh, not uh, and not well compensated. So today we are working to generate better paying jobs, higher quality jobs, and uh, this demands greater specialization from our graduates. And this path uh, really to enter these very uh, competitive markets, Mexico is prepared, continues to prepare itself, and continues up to promote its, its greater presence in them. In this aspect, uh, the role of Mexico in the Pacific Alliance uh, that will open up new perspectives. What will Mexico's participation be in the transatlantic partnership if uh, North America, if it involves North America, the United States, Europe, what will its impact be on Mexico? Uh, well, these are you know, in total agreement with Mexico's vision of being a uh, faithful promoter of free trade that is why uh, Mexico is so open to the world. The agreements that have already been signed and the Pacific Alliance, it is one of the most recent innovative agreements that we entered into with three other Latin American countries, Chile, Peru, Colombia, and which allows us to have an integrated market, not uh, just for a flow of uh, goods, for trade, but also a free transit of people to share capital markets and also to uh, make this greater integration a platform, a more competitive platform to launch, to enter the uh, Asia Pacific market, a market that without a doubt in the last few years has been growing has experienced greater development, and the countries, those countries that believe in free trade, we want to participate in it. So the Pacific Alliance, we believe, promotes the integration of member countries, those that eventually might join it, to be a, because they are consistent with the principles that inspire this Pacific Alliance Agreement that has been signed, that is right now in the process of being ratified by the member countries' uh, legislative congresses. And uh, afterward, after this consolidation, enter the Asia Pacific market. Uh, we've also participated in negotiations for the uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, with uh, some of the countries, where uh, some of the countries that uh, already participate in the Pacific Alliance are also working on. Now, that's another mechanism for integration of American countries with the Asia-Pacific region that probably has a lot of potential. Mexico, nowadays, within this uh, negotiating table that we've worked on participates with great enthusiasm, with full conviction that this mechanism shall materialize as quickly as possible. And Mexico has manifested its political disposition, its commitment to support this agreement. And this reaffirms our position of being open Mexico's position, the one it shows the world and that it wants to continue. President, Mexico traditionally has played a very active role relevant in the international scene. Mexico is the uh, second most important economy in Latin America with a uh, capacity of generating wealth in, uh, of 1.3 trillion per year. It is a member of the G20, uh, which is a source of pride for all Latin Americans. How do you visualize Mexico's new role as a global actor, its ties to Central America, the Caribbean, to all of Latin America? What can we expect uh, from your uh, mandate for Mexico as a global actor? Thank you, President. Uh, well, Mexico, and especially for the government that I am honored to lead, Within its definition of great priorities, there are five, and one of them is for Mexico to fully assume its global responsibility. I have been working uh, to that end, first of all, 
trying to uh, seek closer ties for cooperation mechanisms with our uh, countries in the Latin American region, particularly the Central American and Caribbean region that are the regions that, that are our neighbors, our geographical neighbors, and with the rest of Latin America. And I believe that uh, this is confirmed in the relationship, the diplomatic relationship that we have been working on, that we have been building in a very uh, intense uh, manner. Uh, this is ratified by uh, the meetings I have held with the Latin American presidents, the Caribbean presidents. The definition, determination of mechanisms for greater cooperation. Uh, also, Mexico is a country that is clearly committed to international law. Mexico is a country committed to sustainability and respect for the environment. I must say that Mexico is an extremely diverse country. It is a privileged country because of having in its territory almost 10% of biodiversity in the world. It is a country with the presence of many species that you cannot find elsewhere. It's part of our natural wealth. Mexico is a country that is committed to the tools of fighting global warming. However, um, our contribution uh, to global warming um, might be less. It's only 1%, but uh, notwithstanding, Mexico has assumed legislation, its own legislation, in uh, several of its public policies uh, to make a commitment to sustainability and respect for the environment. Mexico uh, wants to be a leader of this, uh, in this effort. Uh, at the end of the day, scientists have recognized that this is happening because humans, you know, human beings, by working on the development that we have promoted, we have, you know, sadly affected our environment. And uh, Mexico, with great uh, consistency, commitment, has assumed its responsibility in facing this phenomenon. Mexico it shows solidarity toward the causes of uh, humankind. It has shown solidarity uh, in the fight against uh, nuclear disarmament to look for solutions to conflicts everywhere in the world, peaceful solutions, and Mexico born out of uh, this conviction, respect of its principles, which are written in our Constitution, shall continue to work consistently, and of course, uh, assuming its responsibility within the order and peace that we want for the whole world. President Peña Nieto, we could continue talking to you all afternoon, um, especially we haven't talked about Mexico's archaeological treasures, um, Mexico's soft power, which is its culture, um, the movies, music, literature. And uh, I take this opportunity to congratulate you on the 100th anniversary of noted a literary a man, Octavio Paz, which we're celebrating, and you have persuaded us that there is a very coherent, consistent plan for Mexico to become an international dynamic presence, and uh, for all the transformations within Mexico that will enable the country to reach the growth it desires. Um, I am uh, seeing people telling me that, you know, we are, uh, we have to observe the 30 minutes allotted to you. And we'd like to ask the audience for applause for President Peña Nieto. And to ask you, and uh, to ask Marisol Ardieta, our executive director, our executive director for the Latin American Forum, who will uh, pr announce uh, a matter of great importance. Well, for your leadership and commitment to achieve this great consensus that is allowing this transformation, structural transformation, that are fundamental to Mexico and for Mexicans, 
Mexico is living a great moment, which is favorable for Latin America also. Therefore, the World Economic Forum would like to thank you and uh, accept with special pleasure your generous invitation to, have, to hold the World Economic Forum in 2015 in Mexico. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Marisol, who is the Senior Director for Latin America for the World Economic Forum. Thank you all. Mr. President, Leonel Fernandez, once again, I would like to thank you for the opportunity of ha sharing with you briefly several of the changes, especially structural changes conducted by Mexico within the last year. And without a doubt, they are oriented towards um, maximizing the potential of our economic growth in a sustained way so that this will translate into the well-being and greater social development for all Mexicans. I am pleased to see that within this forum, we are accepting the invi invitation to have Mexico as the venue for the 10th World Economic Forum for Latin America in our country. The fact that it's the 10th, which also imposes a great challenge for our country, I hope that it co coincides with the progress made to that forum so that it matches the progress that we make until then, it matches the structural reforms that have been conducted by Mexico. All of this will, again, lead to the economic and social development for Mexicans. And this World Economic Forum for Latin America is definitely very relevant. It is because it joins the countries that have a greater identity in terms of historic, cultural, and language similarities. We are brothers. We share ideals and principles. And having a space for this great Latin American community, this space is a space that we can share our experiences. We can hear voices, authorized voices, and that are of important reference so that we can enrich the actions from the government that will generate new public policies that will give more development socially and economically for Latin America. This is growth. This is how we understand it from the World Economic Forum. This is the purpose of having different events and different venues of the world. And we acknowledge the ones that are taking place here in Latin America in a very special way. That's why we accept with honor having Mexico be the venue for next year's forum, which will enable us to hear the voices of our brother countries and have other countries in the region see what Mexico has been accomplishing in terms of its social and economic development. Thank you very much for the honor of having Mexico as the next venue. Thank you for allowing us to be here today. <laughs>